Hi, I'm Jonathan from Freetronics. We've been working on a bunch of new devices recently and I have prototypes here for some of them. So what I want to do today is give you a bit of a sneak preview. You're going to see um, behind the scenes of production at Freetronics to some extent. You're going to see prototypes that are not necessarily in the final form that they're going to go into production and um, see how we come up with the final production design. So come and have a look over here. I have five new devices here to show you today, but before I get into the specifics of those, I just want to explain a bit about what I mean by prototyping and the process that we go through. Now, a lot of the time you can go straight to production, but it's not always a good idea. If you fabricate 500 or 1,000 of something and you find you've made a mistake, then usually you have to just throw it away. So there are several different ways you can go about the process. Um, in the case of some designs, what we do is we begin by um, prototyping the circuit itself on a prototyping shield or something similar. So sometimes you can build it up using discrete parts. So in this case it's got some regular through hole parts and a module. So this is um, electrically quite a simple design. And what that does is allow us to validate that the design works as we expect. And in this particular case this is a 433 megahertz receiver. So this is a project from the book Practical Arduino. And what that then leads to is once you're confident of the circuit, you can lay out a PCB. So instead of using a prototyping shield, you have a, uh, a PCB that's specifically designed for that purpose. Now, if you are very confident with things like the dimensions of all of the parts, you can go straight to production. And in this particular case, I designed this PCB and then um, I think we had 200 or 300 of those fabricated at once. So we were pretty confident with it. Sometimes that can bite you, and I'll show you some, one place that I messed up. Now this is a power over ethernet mid-span injector, and well, two of them, and the one on the left is the first one that we had fabricated. So I laid out the design for the PCB and sent it off for fabrication. I think I had 200 or so of the PCBs manufactured, and it was a, these four-way RJ45 jacks were a new part that we hadn't used before. So even though I went over the data sheet and measured everything, I still made a mistake when I was laying out the footprint of the parts. Now this part has a little plastic, uh, two little plastic stakes, and it has some metal pins. So the idea is the metal pins are soldered in place to give it mechanical strength, and the plastic stakes give it strength as well. And I got the offsets wrong. So what that meant was I had to cut off the plastic stakes and cut off the pins in order to make them fit into the hole. So to get all of the pins for the connectors themselves lined up and bend the, um, the metal mounts on the back. So I could electrically test that this worked, um, but then we had to throw out a couple of hundred PCBs, which is not too bad, but you certainly don't want to be doing that every day. Um, luckily we discovered that assembling the very first unit and so we didn't waste time assembling a whole bunch of them. So what happened was that we then went to version 1.1 and this is what was produced in large numbers and um, assembled. So it's just got the positions of the mounting holes all in the correct place. And you can see that that's version 1.1, this is version 1.0. Now what this is also showing is something else that you often discover and that you only find when you actually fabricate a real PCB um, I've improved the labels on here and a lot of the time you'll look at something on the computer screen and you think yeah that seems perfectly legible and the text is big enough I can read that clearly and then when you actually fabricate it you find that labels are obscured by uh, parts that are slightly different dimensions to what you expected or text just isn't as big as you thought it was going to be when you're looking at it on the screen so in this particular case I took the opportunity also to improve the labels that you can see on here. So the text just ended up way too small on this particular board. So that was a case where we learned by making a couple of hundred or something, um, but then didn't go ahead with populating the board. So all we lost out on in that case was the PCBs. Now, if you are super confident, you can go straight to production. Now, if you have something that's very simple, like just a breakout board, it might only have one or two parts on it, then um, you know, in that sort of situation we might make the judgement call that hey we're just going to fabricate 500 or 1000 of them and populate them all in one go. So um, for the small modules that's typically what we do. Um, 
The other thing that's a really good hint is print out the PCB and physically put the parts in place. It may sound kind of childish, but it's a great way to catch problems before you get too far down the track. So, um, but the result is that typically what happens is rather than hand assemble a circuit, what we do is design the shield or the Arduino compatible board or module or whatever on the computer. So we lay it out in KiCad or Eagle, get the design as good as we possibly can, check against physical printouts, and until we're very confident that it's ready to go. Then the next step is typically we'll fabricate about two prototypes. Now the objective of course is to get this right 100%. Sometimes you stuff up and this is what the, this is the result. Um, and rather than have a large number fabricated, what we do is we typically make about two production samples of new devices before we go off for larger numbers. And that's what you're looking at here. So these are prototypes that if everything works out, they will go into production exactly as is and we'll then fabricate 500 or 1000 or however many we need of the particular device. But we start off by just making two. So what happens is that these all end up as version 1.0 and if they come back and we test them and everything is good, once they're fully assembled, then we just begin production of a larger quantity. So what we're at here is the stage of testing these production prototypes in order to give a thumbs up or thumbs down on fabricating that particular version in a large quantity. So what we have here um, to start with, this is a LiPo charger. So it's USB input and it's output for a single cell LiPo battery. And um, I'll give you a little demonstration. So I've got a 3.7 volt LiPo cell here. I can plug it into the charger module and I have a micro USB cable here which is connected, it's actually a cell phone charger so that'll provide 5 volts. So I plug it in, comes up with a little indicator saying that it's charging. And this particular module has a smart battery management chip on it. So it's ideal for charging LiPos. What it does is charge at a controlled rate. There are a couple of solder jumpers here so you can specify 100 milliamps, 200 milliamps, 300 milliamps or 500 milliamps charge rate and once it detects the battery is fully charged it backs off and just maintains the battery. The LED is showing that it is currently charging and once it detects that the cell has reached uh, 4.2 volts I believe is the cutoff point for LiPos it switches over the standby LED comes on and it just maintains the battery. So that's a really handy way of being able to charge a LiPo cell to run your projects and um, just charge it off USB. Now we also have something that goes the other way around. So that's to charge the cell from USB. What we also have is this little device, and this is called the USB LiPo. We have this little device, which is called the USB Boost. And what this does is the exact opposite. It takes 3.7 volts in from the cell, and it provides 5 volts out on the USB port. So that's a good way to be able to power your projects from a cell. Now I have here a Leo stick, which is an Arduino Leonardo compatible board in a uh, memory stick form factor. So what I can do is just plug that into the USB jack and you can see it's powered up and it's running happily off the 5 volts supplied from it. So it boosts up from 3.7 volts. It has multiple set points on here so you can specify, depending on the type of battery that you plug in, what it should consider to be the low point on the battery and that way it protects the battery from damage. Things like LiPo cells can't be discharged too deeply or you won't be able to use them again. So by um, cutting or soldering across these little um, jumpers here you can set the, um, the low threshold to 3.75 volts, 2.33 volts or 1.17 volts and um, you can run this down off a single you know, 1.5 volt cell if you wanted to and get 5 volts out and once it hits that threshold so in, by default it's set to 3.75 volts, which is a safe lower limit for LiPo cells. Um, once it gets down to that point, it turns off its output to protect the battery. And um, it also has low battery warning power and it's got logic outputs here as well. So if you wanted to actually sense low battery level, for example, in your project, perhaps you're running a remote data logging system, what you could do is take an input, um, use an input on your Arduino and read the low battery output 
and get some warning that you're about to run out of power and do a uh, night shutdown or something. So that's a really handy little device as well. So that'll, both of those devices will be really good for um, any battery powered project. Now we also have this little device. This is a USB to serial adapter. So it's similar to something like an FTDI cable. You may have seen those where you plug it into USB on your computer and at the other end it gives you a serial port with some additional pins for things like reset control. And some Arduino boards and particularly DIY Arduino. So if you put an 18 mega chip on a breadboard you'll typically need something like this in order to use the IDE to load a program into it. Now the thing is that this does a little bit more than a, just an FTDI cable. FTDI cables come in 3.3 volt and 5 volt versions and they're basically a closed black box so all they do is USB to serial conversion. This is actually identical to the circuit on say an Arduino Uno with the 18 mega 16U2 sitting up in the top left corner converting from USB to serial to talk to the main chip. So this presents itself to the Arduino IDE essentially as if it's an Arduino Uno and on behalf of whatever it is you have plugged into it. So you can use it for direct um, serial conversion or you can use it with the IDE. And we've also got a voltage selection jumper on here. Oh, but no, the other thing is that we've got an ICSP header and we've broken out all of the additional pins on the 16U2. So even though we are going to supply this preloaded with firmware specifically for USB to serial conversion, it's really just a general purpose 16U2 breakout board. So you could load your own firmware on this and use these I.O. pins. You can basically use this like a micro size Arduino. Um, with the voltage selection, that allows you to use it with multiple um, types of Arduino board. So, what I'm going to do is give you a little demonstration. At the moment it's in the 5 volt position. So what I can do is plug it into the cable from my computer and what I have here is an Arduino compatible board that doesn't have its own native USB. This is a Kitten, which is a kit based Arduino compatible board and it has a header on here for an FTDI cable. It runs on 5 volts so what I can do now is just plug that in. You can see that it's powered up by default the kitten is running the blink sketch and now I can slide back over to my computer and I have a copy of blink open here which is set up specifically to run at 10 times a second instead of at once a second so if I click the upload button it's compiling uploading you'll see activity flickers here and now blink is running but it's flashing 10 times a second so that's shown that we've just uploaded to that board now what I can do is unplug the kitten and change the voltage selection over to 3.3 volts and now I can use the exact same thing without any other changes with an Arduino Pro Mini. So I'll just plug it in. This is an Arduino Pro Mini, mini running 3.3 volts at 8 megahertz. And as you can see, once again, it's running the default blink sketch. So I can go back into the IDE. I select a different board type. So I'm going to select a Pro Mini 3.3 volts, 8 megahertz. I'll click upload. Once again, you'll see the activity LED flash and we now have Blink running 10 times a second. So this is a really handy little device. This will be great for loading uh, programs into whatever you know, Arduino compatible board you can build. Now one of the things you may have noticed, and this is an indicator of one of the other things that we learn from doing prototyping, is that it could be quite hard with the RGB LED that we put on here to tell um, incoming and outgoing data because it's showing blue for power and red and green for transmit and receive. But what that means is visually it's just a change of colour. It can be really hard to track. So when I was experimenting with this prototype and making sure that it worked properly, I decided that I didn't really like the use of the RGB LED for transmit and receive activity indication. So uh, what I've done is revised the PCB a little and I've brought a tab out across the top of the connector here and put separate LEDs that are next to the actual pins. So there's an LED next to receive, one next to transmit and one next to power. So as activity flows, like data flows in and out of those ports, 
the LED next to the port itself or next to the pin will flicker. So that'll give a better visual indication. Now normally for something small like that I wouldn't have bothered to revise the PCB design but there is another problem. What I discovered is that there was a mix-up on this particular board with CTS and RTS and DTR which is the handshaking flow control that is used um, by the Arduino IDE to reset the target in order to load a new sketch onto it and I had to cut and jump of the PCB and once it got to the point where I had to modify the PCB anyway I thought oh, I might as well apply some of these other improvements and I've also done things like increase the size of some of the labels once again because I discovered that they weren't clear enough once I saw it like this. Now other, the next device is this little thing here this is a USB ASP compatible programmer. So what this lets you do is plug USB in here and this plugs into the ISP uh, port on your Arduino. So in the case of the kitchen for example it's on here. That's a standard location now for all Arduinos since revision 3. And the programmer plugs in and that lets you do things like reflash the bootloader on the MCU you can load programs without using the IDE and you can also do things like load programs that overwrite the bootloader area to give you use of more of the uh, more of the memory and once again we've made this selectable so it will work with either 3.3 or 5 volt targets and it'll power the target from here so once again this I've had to make a couple of little um, cuts and fixes on this so there'll be some slight revisions on this going into production uh, but that'll be out very soon as well. And the last thing I've got to show you today, this is really cool, I'm very excited about this one, is a little OLED module. This, so OLED is organic LED, and basically it is uh, like an LCD with, it's very strong um, colors, it's very vibrant. And I don't have this connected to power it up and show you, but OLEDs are great for displaying data or you can draw little graphs, you can even display graphics and, um, and pictures on here. Uh, it, the update rate is a little bit slow so you can't really do great animations but you could put games and things on it as well. It's 128 by 128 pixels um, and it's a handy little size. So this one was designed by Angus and um, what we've done is laid extra tabs down the side now on the prototype we didn't bother with the PCB um, doing v-grooving but there's going to be a little groove down each side so that what you can do is use it with the tabs on the side and you can have buttons in here and there is a mounting point for LEDs so you could use this as like a little user interface with menu buttons on it or you could just snap those edges off if you wanted a really small low profile module. Now the uh, the back of the board has driver circuitry on it and as you can see it's got a micro SD card. So the idea is that what we'll be doing is making this available with an Arduino library. So you can just wire this up to your Arduino, load the library and you'll have a nice little graphical interface that you can use for your projects. Now for me personally I love the idea of being able to stick these inside a light switch. So the light switch on the wall will have a little display on it and I can show status of my home automation system or temperature in the room or something like that. That'll be really cool. This will be out very soon. So that's it for now. Um, that's the state of some of the prototypes. We need to do some little tweaks now and then these will go into production. Thanks for checking this out. And I'm hoping to show you some more updates along the way. There are about another six devices that we're working on right now that are just going into prototyping stage. So pretty soon I'll give you a preview of those. And I'll also show you the final result. So once we get full production versions of these, I'll give you a full rundown of them. See you next time.